Right, um, as it's getting on for about five past eight, um, I think we might, and we've got some VIPs waiting there down in, up in London. Um, Javier, over to you to introduce the evening and, and our panelists today. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, tenakoto, 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 katoa, ko Indian Ocean te moana, ko Tamil toko iwi, ko Chandlipai toko mare, no Jaffna ahu, ko Javier Viakasparan toko inua. Good evening and good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for taking time out to join us for our first for the Siren New Zealand branch. We have um, two particularly important members of Siren joining us today. And um, even though uh, it, it's virtually, we're really excited. And, and it just shows um, the international reach of Siren. So before we, I introduce them, uh, just some housekeeping, um, we've sort of, organized it in such a way that it, when we do get to the Q&A session, if you could um, write uh, your name in the chat box so, so then we can open up your microphone and you can ask questions. I think it would be a more organized way without any uh, allowing any backfeed from open microphones. So uh, we, we want this to be as interactive as possible. Uh, our two guests are really keen to hear from our members out here and, um, you know, um, participate in, in, in the institution and, and our visions. So if everyone is clear, I'd like to introduce our first guest, Nikki Roach, who's our Siren president, to start the evening, uh, followed by Terry Fuller, Siren CEO. I will allow uh, Nikki and Terry to introduce themselves. Um, so, welcome, Nikki. Thank you, Javier. I'm just checking you can hear me before we go any further. Great. Um, thank you so much for the warm introduction. Um, and thanks for inviting Terry and I to join you this evening. Uh, and a quick thanks also to the Siren team and Jane, who um, is working really hard behind the scenes to ensure that the tech works. Okay, so I hope this gets, I get this right. Firstly, uh, Tena Koto um, is my absolute privilege, my absolute privilege to be the 34th president of Siren. Um, and evenings like this one, mornings, evenings, are a huge part of why I'm so grateful for this role. Um, in my life pre-COVID, I was a really keen traveler and I'm always aware of the carbon impacts of my travel. I have an irresistible wanderlust that I'm really fortunate has enabled me to see lots of the world, including your spectacular country. Um, but these days we travel through our computer screens and whilst I might not be able to be talking to you from the splendour of Christchurch or Wellington or Gisborne, um, I still feel like I'm travelling by speaking with you all. Um, so uh, I thought I'd just take a few minutes really to share with you um, a little bit about my background. I hope that's not um, uh, too selfish really, but I thought that might be helpful. And um, to share with you a little bit of the presidential induction that I gave uh, back in September. So if you saw that, just go and get a, another glass of wine, Tom, or something, and, um, and then come back in about 10 minutes. <laughs> but uh, I thought that might be helpful for those of you that may not have seen it. Um, and, then, and then Terry's gonna talk to you about all the exciting stuff that Siren are doing at the moment. So bear with me for a few minutes if you can. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm feeling a really heady combination of enthusiasm and excitement and a real sense of responsibility as this year kind of begins. It is absolutely wonderful to be part of an institution and one that I've been part of for a long time, celebrating its 125th birthday this year, and one that not only reflects on its heritage, but looks forward with optimism and real determination. And um, I'm sure, like most of you, I've been reflecting on the circumstances that, that you know, this global pandemic has created. Um, you know, we're here at the moment uh, in, in the UK in lockdown. I have COVID at the moment, so I'm feeling it very definitely personally right now. And I imagine the next 12 months will be a balance of uncertainty and opportunity. But the significant difficulties that are not to be underestimated that some of our members and the communities that their work serves um, 
is are experiencing also generate some opportunities for innovating quickly as we've seen with things like the, the vaccine in, in another sector creating new ways of working just like this although I'd be fibbing if I didn't say I'd rather be in New Zealand right now to be perfectly honest with you um, and finding consensus and for me that's really interesting at really almost unprecedented speed and that gives me hope for the future. So um, I thought that might segue nicely into giving you a little bit of a feel for my presidential theme for the year. And that theme is everything is connected. It's certainly not a new idea. Da Vinci spoke of it in his Principles for the Development of a Complete Mind. But it's John Muir, the 19th century Scottish naturalist and father of the US National Parks, who for me seemed to encapsulate our current challenges perfectly. And he said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. When I was about 10, bear with me, my parents bought me this, the Blue Peter Green Book. So uh, for many of you, that may mean nothing, but for those of you that have spent any time in the UK, you'll remember Blue Peter perhaps fondly as a very long running children's television program. And the Blue Peter Green Book was released um, to accompany the program. I'm gonna read to you the back of the book, bear with me. Uh, you care about our future. You want to know what's happening to the world, but how can you stop the many threats to our planet? Every day seems to bring more gloomy predictions about the environment, but you can act now to make our world a better place. That's the point of the Blue Peter Green book. From the television team who really know what children are thinking and caring about, here's a book that explains clearly and simply what the major environmental problems are and how you can help deal with them. Rainforests stop the destruction, the greenhouse effect, how we can slow it down, our wildlife, how we can protect it, recycling, less waste, the key to our future. The world is in your hands. Save it. 1990. Skip forward a few years. Uh, my parents drove me and my younger brother out on weekend trips to Wales. And on one of these trips, we visited the Elam Valley in, uh, in sort of mid Wales. And it was pretty memorable as I think it was the first time I'd ever seen an impounding reservoir and started to understand what it was for. And this was how Birmingham, which is where I'm from, got its water all the way from Wales, something I'm sure the Welsh will tell you they're less pleased about. But I remember being utterly transfixed and amazed by what I was hearing. Another skip forward and I'm in the middle of almost nowhere for a week in wellies in a tributary to the South Tyne, just off the Pennine Way in the north of England, doing some dissertation fieldwork for my geography degree. I'm looking at river hydraulics with a salt tracer and my friend, and now Simon Fellow, I'm delighted to, to note, is assessing the chemical denudation rate of the catchment. And we are also accidentally destroying her mum's Nissan Micra that she kindly lent us to drive all the way up there without realising it was a 45 minute dirt track to get to the site. And a final leap forward in our story, to the world of work and I'm working in the UK water sector and I'm joining Cywen. I'm managing incidents to avoid loss of water supply to customers. I'm seeing the Falkirk wheel being constructed on a Cywen study tour to, to Scotland. I'm helping my colleagues recycle 150,000 dry tons of biosolids. I'm supporting a water company to deliver challenging plans to reduce household water usage. I'm taking my young son, who in fact might wake up soon, so apologies if there's some background noise, um, to Tyrone um, trustee board meetings with me. Why am I telling you all of this? Well, each of these moments had an impact, left a really strong memory, and ultimately was all connected to exactly the same system. My entire career has been knitted together by the systems that I've worked within and the circularity and the interconnectedness of those systems. And in more recent years, I've spent time thinking and talking about the circular economy and how we embrace its principles across, across our sector. Principles of designing out waste and pollution, keeping materials and products in flow to reduce consumption and regenerating rather than simply sustaining natural systems. I truly believe everything is connected. And I truly believe that SIREM members, we have the collective capability to make a significant difference to our future. And that's why I chose everything is connected rather than a particular topic area as my theme for this year. But the real link for me, however, is always the people. So my time in the river and the dissertation I produced was stronger because of my friend and colleague working with me to refine my approach, especially when heavy rain destroyed half of my sample locations overnight. The customers that we kept supplied with water who were oblivious, thankfully, to the potential impact 
only continue to have that water because of the strong communications between field and customer service teams and service partners working with me to repair that first. When we lost a quarter of our sludge treatment capacity overnight, we resolved that because of the support network of contacts at neighbouring water companies who offered me their treatment sites and supported us over many months. And I didn't have to think twice about continuing to attend board meetings after having my son because Siren colleagues welcomed me and him warmly. And when after about 10 months, he started to crawl and I said to Terry, it's gonna be tricky for me to get to meetings in London these days and I'm, and I'm really sorry. Terry just bought an amazing playpen and we embrace board meetings with an extra member. Bringing us right to today and I work with a team of exceptional colleagues and friends whose strong values and commitment to global resilience and prosperity inspire me every single day. So what I'm saying is relationships have been key to every part of my journey and the connections that I've made, many of which have been through SIWEM, have underpinned so many of those moments. I truly believe that the uniqueness of SIWEM is its breadth and its ability to make these connections. SIWEM is your home if you're an engineer or a chemist or a social scientist or even a geographer. And our members thrive on solving big interdisciplinary challenges. We discuss climate change and flooding, resilience, biodiversity, water quality, the circular economy. The list is long and it's comprehensive and it's full of the important stuff. We have a grounding in public health and a strong heritage, but we're always looking to the future. You'll hear more from Terry shortly, but Simon's plan is to be digital first. And we can see today that in action. And this will help us embrace our membership around the world. For me, that's something that's personally, as I've said, really important. I don't have globes and maps for fun in the background. And um, well, I do technically. Uh, but that will also help us learn from our collective experience. That's what really excites me. So as president for this year, I really hope to use the year to be able to amplify the voices of you, our members, who are doing extraordinary work around the world. And myself and my presidential team will all be looking for opportunities throughout the year to do that. We're just about to start a, a podcast series, which in fact, one of um, the Aotearoa branch Liam is going to be joining us for, which I'm delighted about. And um, I'll be blogging. And I guess what I'm saying is just get in touch with the stuff that you want to share, whether that's through me, through the executive, through the normal channels. But we just want to hear more about what's going on around the world. I think we have an imperative to reflect the communities that we serve. This is a challenge to many of the sectors our members represent, and I really hope that my theme for the year enables us to continue to have more of those authentic conversations about how SIOM is truly diverse and inclusive as a community. And joining a professional institution is a really significant decision for, for those of you that decided to become a chartered member, you're stating externally that you will personally uphold the values of the institution, regardless of your role or who you work for. And we really want to see, we want to see our members see SIOM as a really safe place and one in which they can always be their full selves and which enables them to develop and perform at their very best. Well, and the challenge. We know we face a climate and ecological emergency. We knew that in 1990, didn't we? And the pressures of population growth, infrastructure resilience and more extreme weather events now feel more real than ever before. And the challenge of bringing new approaches to tackle those systemic problems is here. And now I've reached my grand old age and I'm no longer a, very far from being a young member of SIWEM. I just keep thinking, if not now, then when? And if not us, then who? And so at my induction, we assembled a panel that represented a really broad spectrum of our sector, included the water sector, NGOs, and environmental regulator, the Environment Agency, in fact, Tom. Um, the president of the ICE, Rachel Skinner, who some of you I'm sure will know, um, and a member of one of our SIOM technical panels. And I posed the panel three questions. Um, and if you're interested in what they said, then you can watch the webinar back. It's on the SIOM website, just have a hunt for presidential induction. But we asked one really key question of all of the attendees at that induction. And um, as Javier said at the start of this, um, I'm 
really interested and I know Terry is in your views so whilst this is a great opportunity for us to share a little bit about um, what we're thinking we're really interested in what you're thinking so once we've heard from Terry we're going to return to a key question and pose that to you guys so I'm going to give you some thinking time but this is what I'm going to ask it's a really simple one what actions can we take as SOA members now to meet the challenges of climate change and the ecological emergency and they may not bear fruit quickly but I'm really interested in what people are doing tangibly or what you think we should be doing that we're maybe not doing. So we'll come back to that shortly. Uh, and then at the end of this session, we're going to be announcing the winners of your photography competition, which I'm really excited about. But with that question, hopefully mulling around in your mind, I'm going to hand over to Sirem's Chief Executive, Terry, to talk a little bit more about Sirem's aspirations. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Nikki. Can I just check you can hear me also? Thumbs up. Excellent. Thank you. Well, uh, Tenakutu, uh, good evening to you all. Um, my name is Terry Fuller. I'm the Chief Executive of SIWEM. Um, I'm just going to talk to you quite briefly because, as Nikki said, we um, we really want to be able to do some listening um, this evening and uh, and hear your thoughts and ideas. Um, I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to be able to talk to our friends in uh, Aotearoa um, and to have that time to listen to your views and, and answer uh, any questions because SIWEM's branches are of the utmost importance uh, to our institution. Um, you are a place of belonging for many of our members and especially those outside of the UK. You make our vital outreach possible. Nikki's spoken about some of that. And of course, you're part of our, our network, um, not only for our members, but also other stakeholders as well. And ultimately, the general public that uh, the SIWEM is there to serve as a charitable institution. You're a great source of knowledge, experience, and science and evidence, which are the foundations of everything that we do. And those foundations come from our members in congregated in our branches all around the world. Now this year our institution is 125 years old and what a year to pick to be to have a big birthday. Um, but it's also it's not just uh, a, a celebration of, of, um, of history for our institution. I also note that the, uh, the origins of uh, this branch actually go back to a network that was formed in the 1990s. So it might feel um, new to some of us now, but uh, we do have a, a heritage and a, a legacy of, um, of sharing experiences um, within the country. And the history is important, and it's important because it's equipped us to face what is without doubt the most important time in our existence. And Nikki has characterized some of that. Um, never have we been more relevant um, or have our services been more needed. And there is actually only one way that we'll meet these challenges, the challenges presented by the climate and ecological emergencies that we face. And that is by harnessing the diversity of experience, ideas, viewpoints, knowledge in the world around us. Diversity is not just about social justice, it's actually existential. So we have unprecedented opportunities and those require unprecedented responses. And so I want to just share with you uh, one thing, really, that uh, we're going to be doing about this. Next year, SIWEM will take the most significant transformation in our history to a whole new level. As Nikki mentioned, we're adopting the title Digital First to describe our ambitions, but it's vital that we really understand what we mean about this. Our aim is actually to rebuild from scratch the way we present ourselves to the world. Now this is going to require investment in new technologies and tools that will open up the support we can give to enhancing and developing our members, careers, and to present everything that Cyberm has to offer to anyone who is interested. But it's important to recognise that technology is the enabler, not the driver. As Nikki said, Cyberm is a people organisation. It's people that have ideas, wishes and solutions, and it is people that Digital First must serve. Now, above all, if we're to succeed with this, we need high quality factual content and lots of it, and we need it from all around the world. 
And Nikki's given you some examples of that. We need a diverse community of people to be excited and inspired and engaged in that content and to enter into a global conversation that we will achieve and that we, we will achieve um, and we will achieve this through our branches. If this all sounds a little bit futuristic, then let me tell you that it's not. We've already made significant progress. In fact, right now it is testimony to some of that progress. And so I will leave you with just three ways that you can individually become involved in our Digital First programme. First thing, tell us about what you're doing and your ideas. Create webinars, blogs, podcasts, written editorial, art, poetry, film, photography, any media that you think uh, helps to convey ideas and to uh, encourage dialogue. The second thing is promote and share our digital content, our webinars, our training, our policy literature, our publications, and talk to people and tell them why they should be members of SciWeb. And thirdly, please introduce Nikki and I to people and organizations that you think should have a relationship with SciWim. We would love the opportunity to learn more about Aotearoa and share the benefits SciWim has to offer. I'm going to leave it there because as Nikki says, we really do want to be able to listen now and, uh, and, and hear what, um, what you'll have to say. But I will just finish by uh, saying thanks so much to Javier, Tom and Peter for making this webinar uh, possible this evening and all of the th really great and exciting things that are happening in in the branch um, and also of course my thanks to the SciWEM team who are, are sitting there in the background um, sipping coffee and making sure that everything works well for us this evening. Okay I'll hand back over to uh, Tom I think uh, and just say uh, thank you very much to you all. Thank you guys, that was very um, motivating and, and great to hear your perspective. So um, thank you both. Um, would you like us to address your question now or can we take questions from the floor from um, people? Because I have a question to start with as I have the mic. So uh, I think I will, if that's all right, everyone. Mm -hmm. um, obviously there's been, how can Siwam help us as, what I like to think of are experts that have potentially in the last few years from certain governments been dismissed as you shouldn't listen to experts um, and a certain president who's on his way out hasn't necessarily listened to scientists in the most recent times. How can you as sort of SIWEM as a force help us in our day to day jobs? Do you want to pick? I mean, I, I have a view, Terry, but I'm sure probably yours is the correct view. But just as an aside, I discovered the other day you can get Make Rivers Great Again jumpers, which I'm totally going to get. The Rivers Trust in the UK have been launching them. I'm like, so just as a, from one president to another, Tom, Make Rivers Great Again is what you should be wearing, in my view. But Terry, I'll give you a, a proper view, I'm sure, and I can add something to that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I mentioned in, in what I said that um, the foundations of SciWEM are about. Uh, high quality sort of content, fact, science, evidence. And these are things that have become perhaps less popular, uh, certainly with a certain outgoing um, president. I, I think, you know, SIOM has a key role really to help people navigate through all of this information that's out there at, at the moment uh, and, and point to the, that which is of good quality and, and evidence based. And then, you know, to help solutions to develop, which are, um, of course, then ap appropriate. So I think that's a really key role for us. Could I just add something, Terry, would you mind? Mm, of course. That is slightly more serious. I thought I genuinely have added the Make Rivers Great Again jumper to my Christmas list. Um, I guess, Tom, um, this will sound like a plug, which it sort of is, but we're just about to start recording a podcast series in about two hours. And the first um, edition we're recording is with Al Chisholm, who some of you I'm sure will know as the Director of Policy at SIWEM, and a chap called Jake Rigg, who's an External Communications Director for Affinity Water Down in the southeast of, of the UK. And um, the topic of the podcast is advocacy. Um, and so Jake is an ex-political lobbyist and an ex-government advisor. Al's obviously got a wealth of policy experience. 
the reason that we've chosen that as a topic to explore over you know a half an hour more in-depth conversation is because of the importance of ensuring that our voices are heard by government in particular and that's something that you know Terry will attest to Al's got bags of experience and is great at and I think um when when I spoke with Jake his view was we could do a better job of this in the sector actually you know with somebody who used to work for government his view is certainly in the UK and he's worked in the US as well when we're not great as a sector necessarily it's sometimes speaking the same language as government and we ne don't necessarily do it in the most timely fashion or it might be um yeah we just sometimes the cogs don't mesh and so the point of that pod is to explore that and work out how do we translate um how do we translate what the sector knows we need and that expertise into policy and into policy change and so um I mean, it is a slightly blatant plug for the pod, but the point being more importantly that um, I think we have a real role, but it's not just about having the technical expertise, is it? It's about then thinking about how do, what do we do with that and how do we communicate that effectively? Because there's no point having an echo chamber just talking to ourselves, actually, the people that we need to move are, well, one of my colleagues says, it's not, you're not training Olympians, it's the couch to 5K. How do we shift everybody off the couch and start them running? rather than just a few gold medal winners, I guess. So that would be my only build. Thanks for the question. Thanks, guys. Um, any of our attendees? Ah, someone's got their hand. Liam. Kira, how are we all? Um, good. Hey, thanks, Nikki. Thanks, Terry. Um, you, you, you raised a couple of questions. Uh, and I suppose the first one I'm going to uh, respond to is about, about that rich head around climate change. And I suppose just the approach that you're, uh, the, the, you know, I completely applaud around digital first really, really must be about equity. So the equity of the messaging, the equity around affordability and equity around accessibility. Not everyone has access to digital uh, technologies around the world that we need to be co you know, cognizant of. So I suppose the advice is right, you know, thinking about what is it that we're, you know, how can we make sure that we are being equitable? Uh, and one of those, I suppose, that we kind of, we felt from a New Zealand membership in the past, and we've seen some of sort of declining membership over, over recent years, is what's that value and price point being really, really key around the digital content? Because for many years, we've always been questioned about what's the value of a SOWA membership to a New Zealand marketplace. We've got our view, we're still members, um, but uh, it's equally important on the you know, institution to value that uh, um, and you know, uh, enhance those community connections. Yeah. That's, that's my point rather than a question. Okay. Thanks, Liam. Could, um, should I perhaps just respond to that that point? Because um, I think there is a question in, in there as well, um, or yeah. at least implied in terms of, you know, had we thought of these things and what yeah. we do about it. Um, and I mean, certainly one of the ways that this year has been quite helpful, not only to our organisation, but probably to many, is that yeah. it's highlighted both the possibilities, but also the difficulties with um, digital media and uh, we absolutely need to remember that there are people who uh, who will not be able to gain access in some cases at all and in other cases it might be limited and that's a serious concern for us because you know I, I firmly believe if we're going to answer Nikki's question we have to do it together as a planet and I really hope that doesn't sound trite because I absolutely believe this the, 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 the difficulties we face are too complex for any pocket of people in our world to resolve. So we do have to, um, you know, SIWEM's role now has got to be to be out there, uh, reaching as many people as possible and listening to as many people as possible. Um, and I'm not sure I have a full answer to you yet, really, as to how we're going to do that. But I can assure you we are very conscious of the fact that, they're, um, that it needs to be um, equitable. Cool. And I mean, we're in, we're in a fairly you know, uh, advantageous position in, in Etara because two thirds of our population have access to you know, internet co connectivity. It's uh, sorry, broadband fast connectivity. A lot more have a, have, a, have access, um, and that was just because of, of some great foresight of about ten years ago. We don't have that luxury across the globe, 
Um, so, you know, making sure that our our ability to connect with those communities is really, really cautious. Yeah, really, really key because you say we are all in it together. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, although I have to say, as I experience more places around the world, it, it never ceases to surprise me as to how digital yeah. a lot of places yeah. are, you know, and governments, for example, put a lot more store in um, fiber optic networks than sadly they do about water supply uh, in some places. So, you know, I think we also need to remember, and I, and I did try to say this, that, you know, it's very easy to get caught up on technology when we have these conversations, but it is all about people still. And, you know, let's not forget there are immense challenges out there um, uh, which despite perhaps your average young person thinking that um, broadband is the be or an end all, there are things we know, of course, which are far more important than that. Tom, can I um, hijack your excellent job of facilitation for a second? Because I just noticed that Sumo popped a, Q a question on the Q&A that potentially I could was segue... Ask that that question oh, to you, Nikki. So please, no, go ahead. <laughs> well, I just thought, um, I mean, Terry will have a view from a website perspective, but I was just, um, I was just going to offer my views, if that's okay. Sima, thanks so much for asking the question. Um, it's something that um, I, I've been thinking about, like on a, on a personal note, and Terry and I were chatting a little bit earlier on this week, weren't we? Well, whenever it was last week, I've lost track of days now, um, about the work the Environment Agency are doing in the UK about engaging younger people. So classically, you know, we, SOAM has always been a, um post um well once you start work kind of institution then we've drifted into universities and accreditation and i've been drifted in a positive way but actually um, and and then you realize oh we sponsor the um uh stockholm junior water prize and actually that's from about 14 and then like on a really personal note i have a three and a half year old and i was um looking at primary schools I was doing you know virtual primary school open days this week last week and i was chatting to a head teacher who um the primary school just at the end of my road and she said to me Oh, yeah, well, one of the things we're doing, we're working with Leeds Climate Commission, which is like a, um, a citizen's jury that's happening where I live in Leeds in the north of the UK. And um, we're working with them to take a climate change um, curriculum into the classroom from, from four and upwards and work out how we do that and what that looks like and what resources we need and how do we embed it into the curriculum. Um, and I went from thinking, oh, the primary school at the end of the road could be OK to how do I get my son to go to the primary school at the end of the road? Because if that's the leadership that's happening there, then that's what I want him to be part of. And so um, I guess the reason I wanted to reply sooner, if nothing else, was like, I really feel that. And, you know, I don't waft this around for a laugh. This is a really old book, but it had an impact. Like, it's the reason that I'm, well, definitely a big part of the reason that I'm standing here. And, you know, all of this nonsense is, it's, um, I feel it, you know, inside. And I, I don't think you come into the sector for the cash, do you? So I think most of us feel the same. Um, and actually, what is our responsibility to be able to inspire and communicate? And for me, evidence led, that's what's really exciting. So this isn't a, um, it, it, we don't feel like a campaigning organisation whilst we might advocate, we feel like an evidence and science led organisation that then advocates based on that. And that's a great skill, isn't it, for kids, I think, to have. So I don't have a clever answer about how we deliver it. And I'm sure Terry might have some thoughts. Um, but I guess what I would say is I feel it in the same way that I think you probably feel it. And most of us that have any connection with young people, it doesn't need to be that we have kids, but, you know, we have to make sure that they get they get the evidence and they get the science and they get the analytical skills to be able to make sense of that work. So, yeah, that's kind of a, a bit of a rambly answer, but I wanted to reply to it. So thanks for the space, Tom. <laughs> Terry, did you want to add anything? Well, just uh, well, just to absolutely endorse what what Nikki's just said because it's been, it's been my experience. Um, I mean, last week I was um, on several um, calls with educational institutions in, in Pakistan, um, and that was from uh, school aged uh, children and young people through to university and post grads, and. Um, the point one of the points that was made was that the um the education in this the curriculum at the young young school ages in pakistan around climate is is not good enough bluntly and that's exactly the same in the uk i, you know, I look at the uh, uk curriculum 
and um, it just is is poor in terms of climate and the levels of knowledge and understanding in a lot of uh, our, our teachers um, is is poor. Um, so I don't, I don't want to just extrapolate from two countries around the world, but my my hunch is that you know we've got to get um, better at, at educating people at, uh, at the youngest of ages, and um, we do. Siwem does have a role to play in that, and there are certain things that we are are doing to contribute to that. Cool, thank you. Uh, for me, it was the animals of Farthing Wood, if anyone ever watched that. Mm. That was what got me um, into environmental science. Um, Peter Matthews, I believe you had a question. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to go back to the question um, about what we can do as individuals uh, and the value <clears throat> that we bring to society. Um, it's very important for us to understand that professional institutions are part of the matrix. So we talk about what governments do, what corporate organizations do, and what we do as individuals. But we are here as a professional institution to support the role of individuals in delivering what society wants. We are, we are, the, we are the shock troops at the front delivering uh, all that we want to do um, as a society. Uh, and um, uh, we've got a long history in SIWEM of making a contribution to government. Uh, and I'd be interested, to, first of all, to hear what uh, SIWEM New Zealand is doing to feed into the policy development of the New Zealand government. The other point I want to make, which is connected to that, is that uh, the pandemic is dreadful. We would, none of us would want it to be here, but there is a silver lining to it that we can exploit. In that, it has strengthened the public empathy and understanding of the role of professionals. Um, uh, I'm uh, in my late 70s. I'm a, a past president in my late, late 70s. And in my long career, I have never seen so many professionals so many experts on television or in the newspapers as we see every day, certainly in the UK. Our Prime Minister yesterday emphasised the role of science and solid based evidence in delivering the vaccines. And this new public understanding of statistics, the value of research, the value of composed evidence I think is something which is a magnificent step forward uh, in, in the sort of things that we can do in, in future. And we should exploit this. We should, we've always been solid evidence-based organization, but now is our time in terms of what we can do for uh, the climate change emergency. I, I, I must confess, I prefer to use the expression climate change rescue, uh, because I think there's a slight touch of fatigue about crisis and all the rest of it at the moment so we need to find a new syntax uh, more empathetic anyway my point is that it's about the role of the institution itself in delivering all of these issues and the role of experts sure great Tom, points Tom, uh, can... go on liam go ahead i can, I can answer that, i suppose so Peter, uh, thanks very much for the question uh, posed to the, the Siwen branch out here. And I suppose individually, or uh, you know, and even to a certain extent, some, co some collectives within the individuals within the branch are very much doing that, trying to influence the policy, trying to influence uh, you know, on a local, a regional, and even a national scale. Um, but currently I'd suggest that we, we personally don't have the bandwidth to enable a institutional response or collect an institutional response uh, um, on, on very many topics. So we'd have to pick and choose them very carefully. I think, can, if I can just add to that one, I think, um, you know, through building our relationships between SIWEM and the, and the Lights of Water New Zealand, that'll give us a lot more of an opportunity um, to, to help in that advocacy space and in, in influence space and bring, you know, the, the vast international knowledge from, from SIWEM 
um, to help us learn and influence in, in New Zealand as well. We're about to go through a major water reform. We're getting a water regulator. Um, there's changes to, to the sort of freshwater um, act and they're about to look at the resource management act I and mean, there's a huge huge amount going on here at the moment so i'm i'm really sort of keen to uh, e explore i guess how, how we can sort of build on the the mou between the two, two organizations so that we can really sort of connect and learn more from each other so um Perhaps that's something you know for for Nikki and Gillian to um, comment on here, and yeah, how how we could make the most of that. We're we're a small group, the Cywem group in New Zealand, but there's some very experienced people. And what we what I guess how we started this down here was a group of expats, but we're starting to see some real interest from the the new generation of scientists and engineers coming through here, who who want to learn and they want to get access into international knowledge. Um, so we have a great opportunity now. There's actually a great question from Gillian uh, um, about that. Probably be good to, to hear from you, Gillian, if uh, you've got the microphone. Yep, so I've got to turn my own mic off. Um, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto kato. Great to be able to talk to London, my home. Um, so, I'm Gillian Blythe, Chief Executive of Water New Zealand. For those of you who are not familiar, Water New Zealand is the industry association for the three water sector in Aotearoa. One of the, it's great, Dan, to be able to hear you say we're um, being able to leverage our strengths because that's clearly something that would be really good and to be able to sit down probably in the new year, looking at my diary around the MOU would be a great first step. Um, my question that I was, uh, keen for, for you to, to consider is encouraging people to work in the water sector at multiple levels, whether it's at the drinking water operator stage or at the wastewater operators through to engineers and scientists is absolutely critical. How can SIWEM New Zealand and SIWEM globally help this? Thank you, Julian. Um, shall I perhaps have a, a go at responding to that? And um, Nikki, I'm sure you've got some thoughts on that as well. Um, so my, I mean, this is a question actually that we, we face right across the, the sector, water being, of course, amongst um, perhaps the most important, but um, generally, you know, how do we encourage the, the best talent, the finest minds to, to get involved in what we know are, are really important, um, but also really awe-inspiring careers to actually, um, you know, choose to follow. And um, I think, I mean, it, it, it involves starting early and I think it also involves um, working on and with parents. Um, we, you know, we find that young people are very much influenced by um, the steer that their parents give. And I think for water in particular, the biggest challenge we have is that we just don't value it enough. Now, particularly in, and I, I actually, and I say that particularly in a country like the, the UK, where you know we can turn a tap on and, and there it is, and it's cheap. We don't have to you know, pay very much money for it. Um, other parts of the world, of course, less so. But generally, this sort of undervaluing of, of water is not helpful to us at all. Um, and you know, if we think in places like the UK, where uh, it does at the moment come out of the tap, it's always going to we are of course sadly mistaken and we know that water stress is one of the biggest challenges we face around the planet so i would start with working on um you know publicizing how valuable this this resource actually is and how vital it is uh, and a lot of the work we're doing at the moment with schools things like our stockholm junior water prize for example um, is aimed at, at raising that sort of awareness and um Oh, would you like me to build on it, Terry? I, can, I mean, I always can, can't I? I mean, it's very rare I don't have something to say. Um, Gillian, it's lovely to meet you. Uh, and um, uh, we're not all in London, by the way. Prize for guessing where we are. Uh, so <laughs> um, thank, it would be really exciting to hear a bit more about the MOU. My only, um, I guess my only builds, I got two really. Um, one is that lovely phrase, you can't be what you can't see. And I think um, we have a responsibility to be visible, actually, as professionals and the kind of stuff that um, the sector is leading on. You know, you think about the climate strikes that we saw 
um, certainly well globally, didn't we, earlier on this year and um, back end of last year, um, suddenly there was this immense visibility of, of something that we've all been talking about and, um, and thinking about in our careers through a range of different avenues for years, really. So there's something about making sure that we're visible and we demonstrate that this is a sector that if you want to make that kind of change, this is the place to be so that we get the, um, you know, we get the brightest and the best, but the most passionate, I guess, individuals. Um, I think we have a responsibility to think about how we're really open and inclusive. Um, so that whole you can't be what you can't see also means whatever your background, whatever your, you know, whatever your set of circumstances are that you see that this could be a place where you could develop as an individual, regardless of your organisation. That's always been something really important to me is that my, you know, my SIOM chartership and so on and so forth has been something I've been able to take ownership for. It's not been my employer's responsibility. And so it's very much felt like it's my personal development, which is which I think is important. Um, but the other thing I was going to say is about about membership and actually what I'm taking real comfort from is, you know, the membership grades that we've got now enable people to come into SOM, even if you haven't um, gone through a classic kind of university academic route. So and actually a, a, a former colleague of mine at the water company um, in the UK found out last week that he's just been chartered and he's gone through. He hasn't come through university route. He's gone through a slightly, you know, a slightly different route um, and he's he's utterly delighted I'm utterly delighted for him he's going to do a little post for um the website to talk about that so it's about making the point that um th that we have standards for a very very important reason but the, the standards are you know it's like an it's an output measure it's not an input measure it doesn't matter how you get to that standard it's getting there that's important and we'll support you to get to that point so for me there's something about making sure that people know that and are inspired but then we also make it accessible for them to join us when they want to so Hi, Julian. This is Pete Brooks. Um, I'd just like to add a bit more of a grassroots view from New Zealand, if I may. Um, I've been involved with SOIM for a number of years and obviously have been leading some of the way. Um, the, what we've been able to do, I'm a dual member of Warden New Zealand as well, so it gives you an idea that I, yeah, it is a respected and understood organisation within New Zealand and actually within the professional industry. What I feel that the... MOU and the relationship SIOM and Water New Zealand has had and can build on is about actually training that next generation. You know, Nikki actually inspired me to see that Blue Peter book. Um, my inspiration was actually paddling the canals of the uh, the Midlands um, in the late 80s. So um, I've seen it at its worst. But I think just building on that, Julian, I think what we need to do is there's a genuine gap and I've spent best part of three years at Auckland Council trying to inspire the next generation into what they need to know to be able to support what will be a, the new water regulator, what will actually reform the three waters and what actually that brings and having those people ready to be, actually apply for those positions and have an internationally recognised qualification and chartership. I think that's really quite powerful. Um, I think the MOU is a great starting point, but I think we between us and it'd be really would lovely to meet you and apologies I, we haven't met but I think it'd be a great opportunity to actually align that and actually start to st streamline some of the learning I, I love the digital view I think that's yeah we've we've sort of embraced that by accident um earlier this year by with our um with our webinar series and this is one part of that um but no more than happy to work with you I think what we can actually do is actually see some of the benefits because it's coming from the UK and actually that regulated industry there will be some benefits that come with that but there's also some pain and I think what we need to do is make sure the people in the industry are capable and competent to deal with that pain and deal with it professionally and accurately and from a position of expertise. Thank you Peter if I may just add to that I mean Peter and I uh, Gillian we've already started to have conversations around how we can help connect um, some of the, the, the people um, in the water industry here in, in the UK that uh, can share experiences because, of course, you've got, in, you've got the golden opportunity to learn from others' mistakes and to pick the best out of, of current practice. And so um, it'd be really good to take this conversation forward after today um, to see how we can um, you know, int perhaps introduce you to some of the folk that um, are within our um, network here. 
Look, that would be lovely. One of the things that when I spoke at our conference last week, I introduced um, the concept of what I see water New Zealand standing for and are all around water with um, uh, for the New Zealand people. The W stands for why is why water is water in, in terms of from a te ao Māori perspective, a Māori worldview, A being technical advice, T is workforce training, E is events, R is relationships. And one of the things that I said was that it's really important to be able to rebuild some of those relationships with other organizations. And SIWEM was one of the ones that I was, you know, I had in my mind when I was when I was standing on the stage. So that would be really good, Peter and Dan and, and Liam to be able to spend some time sitting down and actually really understanding what the MOU um, says because having been a chief executive for only for the last four months at Water New Zealand, there's a lot of things that are in filing cabinets and it would be great to be able to give some life to some of these documents and, and work out what's actually a plan of attack and how we can do this as we go through because the new regulator is wanting to lift capability and we need to be able to rise to the challenge over the next few years. So Absolutely. thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I absolutely hear what you're saying about MOUs. I think they're in, um, an important part of um, stating intent. But um, what we want is active MOUs that don't sit on a shelf at all. They're out there at the forefront of what we're doing all the time. So uh, I absolutely support the, uh, the idea that if we're going to do this, we make it meaningful. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you. I was just going to add one quick thought as well, really, which is, and I just know this because uh, somebody who's in my network has just become a asylum fellow who's um who's an associate director at Offwat, so the office of um the, what's the water regulator the economic regulator in the uk obviously um and i and i've just saw on the q a that um mike watson if that's if that's the mic i think it is and that's the chair of the china and humber branch has also joined us today which is lovely up here in yorkshire um but he's further north than me um i just i would imagine actually there'll be huge amounts of interest from not just the UK, but you know, the, a new water regulator isn't something that happens very often, is it? So, as well as those very important individual conversations that are happening, I'm sure there'd be a, a community that would be interested in um, being part of a wider conversation. Perhaps I don't know what that looks like or how we facilitate it or what the benefits are. But um, I guess what I'm saying is, I'm sure there are lots of people that that have experience and views that potentially would welcome sharing those. I guess so. Um, maybe that's something to explore in your conversation, Gillian. And, and the team as to as to how else do we harness the power and how do we how how does how does the the new Aotearoa regulator skip some of the mistakes that we perhaps might have made? We talk a lot about silos, certainly in the UK, and the way that water is regulated environmentally and economically and from a quality perspective is all very separate. And then that has ramifications. It'd be really exciting to explore um, how you maybe avoid some of the potential pitfalls that we might have found ourselves in. So those yeah. are my thoughts for what they're worth. Indeed, and I know I'm conscious we're running out of time. So just a couple of things just to, to mention that have come up through the chat. Um, I mean, Robin has joined us, who's an editor within um, our Water and Environment Journal. Um, that's a really powerful resource, actually, and I commend people to have a, a look at that. If you haven't seen it and you're not a member, um, contact us and, and I'll, I'll uh, arrange for you to have a, a look at it. But that's a great sort of technical resource. And the other thing just to mention is that, the, that one of the underpinning um, parts of SIWEM is our technical panels. So we talk about evidence and science and advice and advocacy. Um, it's our sort of 15 or so uh, specialist panels, which um, are the intellect behind that. And that's, um, that's not just something to draw from, it's something to input into as well. Uh, so we share experiences. One of the things we talked about when we um, set up the last MOU, uh, which hasn't been as active as it could be, was that opportunity to share articles between uh, the Water New Zealand Journal here and, and SIWEM Journal and, and do that on a regular basis, which I think will help everybody feel more connected. And also, you know, it's of interest to see what's happening in different parts of the world. So that, that's an easy thing to do. People are writing those journal articles, magazine articles. It, it should be quite easy, I would have thought, to, to just sort of transfer some of that knowledge very um, straightforwardly. Well, and we have to do that, Dan, because, you know, once we do um, really get our digital first capability up and running, this is going to be a, a, a mighty thing that's going to need feeding. It's going to be hungry for content. And, and boy, do we have to keep that high quality content coming. So I think it's really important that, you know, we do connect together 
uh, and generate the, these ideas. Great. Um, I'm conscious we've come up to the hour mark. So um, unless there's anyone particularly burning questions you want to raise or answer, Nikki and Terry? I could talk all evening, actually, or morning for us, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, we could keep going. <laughs> yeah, we could, because we've got to start a bad day now, but... Uh, I mean, You've no. got a podcast to record in a couple of hours, Nikki, or an I hour know. now, probably. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Which we'll, we'll all be listening to. So. Um, I was just... Sorry, Terry, I was going to say, I was mindful that Liam asked about, uh, Liam and Paul have both asked questions that we haven't got to. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to give you my 25 second answer, in fact. Can we do a digital study tour? I mean, I don't work for Simon, but I, my yes would be the resounding answer from me. Like, why don't we talk about, is that possible? Because mm -hmm. I miss travel so much and um, I would love to see the world digitally. And I'm sure there's something exciting we could do. And that could be a great way of engaging perhaps some of our younger members as well in terms of creating content and I'm looking forward to seeing Terry on TikTok and um, Paul I don't even know what TikTok is I just said it I've got no idea I'm too old Paul um, in terms of your point about waste I don't have a clever answer but we've got a seminar in December where we're talking it's UK centric but talking about Covid and the way the water sector has responded to Covid and I'm chairing that and I'm really happy actually to talk about to make sure we talk about waste as part of that and see what you know see what the panelists view is um, I think I think there's a whole raft of strands we can go along there but we do do bits and pieces with CIW and the Chartered Institution of Waste Management certainly and when, when we've done we did a masterclass in the circular economy last year and we um, co-promoted that with CIWM so there are conversations I'm not saying we have a full answer there but there are conversations and I'm happy to pick some of that up um, with um, with the seminar in December if that's helpful as well so I just didn't want to miss those questions Tom sorry. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's it's great in a way that we've run out of time. I'd much rather run out of time than, mm -hmm. than having to fill time. And I think uh, you know Jane will um, will capture the the discussions and the questions that have been asked. So we can we've got opportunity to take some of these away and, and reflect a bit and keep this conversation going after after this evening this morning. Yeah, we also Nikki, have a photo want... competition, don't we? I was going to say, Nikki, if you wouldn't mind doing the <laughs> before you, before you go oh, yeah. and. Um... I'm hoping Jane's going to bring. Can you just tell us where is the map of? Uh, well, I can't believe we needed to have a little. It should have been on the Q and A. There's so many expats on this call, and uh, you know, I'm going to do the photo competition. If you think you know where I, where I am, because this is where I am, then um, pop it in the Q and A, and I'll tell you at the end. Is that right? <laughs> like that for okay, everyone. There you go. <laughs> Let's, guesses, guesses are ready. And a, a virtual oh, chocolate right. fish will be. Winging its way to you, wherever you are. There's a reservoir here, just saying. So, and a few more up there. Right. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure as well as a very, very keen amateur photographer to um, uh, to announce the winners of the Aotearoa Environmental Photography Competition 2020. So, um, I am reliably informed by Tom and I trust him that um, Murray Cave and Michelle Hislop, who are uh, independent judges, have um, looked at the winners for all three categories and they've given us an overall winner as well. So we're going to run through um, some of the some of the winners and then the ultimate winner on the screen, I think. Is that right, Tom? We've got some of the images coming up. So from our animals and the environment, we had joint winners. Um, the first one, I'm tired of lockdown. Matt, I feel similar. Um, the judges said, very cute, lovely clarity on the image. Uh, it feels very autumnal, actually, and I'm sure it wasn't. Um, so lovely shot, well done. Um, and the second image, and I think he's on the call, Scout Watching Sunrise, beautiful shot from Peter Brooks, lovely warm colours, good composition. And I approve of the dog's name because my son's called Atticus. So I'm assuming there might be a similar link there, Peter. So um, be really beautiful photographs, both of you. So well done to Matt and to Peter for the uh, Animals and the Environment section. Um, the Future of the Environment winner. This is an extraordinary structure. So Jason Cavallo, I think, is the photographer at the Atira. Forgive me if I get the pronunciation wrong, Viaduct. And um, the judges comments were futuristic when it was built, still futuristic today. And I agree entirely. That's a spectacular landscape. Um, and then we come on to the your environment section. So in third place, um, with comments around um, composition and it's beautifully composed, isn't it? Tom Kennard's The Road Less Traveled. So very well done, Tom. Um, I could look at that all day as well. Really lovely leading lines. In second place um, by Holly Foreman, a beautiful shot, Holly Canopy Jigsaw. 
the judges said they loved the imagination and um, great texture and um, I'm sure you've got a back covered in leaves lying on the floor doing that but it's a beautiful photograph really worth it um, and then drum roll the ultimate winner so before it comes up um, the judges praise this shot for a great vista with striking colours um, technically the contrast to the bright sky was handled really well and this will give it away the ski tracks draw the eye into the picture and highlight the human involvement in this remote and precious environment. So very many congratulations to Angela Pratt, who is the Aotearoa Environmental Photographer of the Year and um, with her shot, Lucky or Guilty. I could just look at that all day. Well done, Angela, that's absolutely And I, I believe from looking at the participation list that Angela's on the call. So oh, I don't know well, very you... well done. Well done, well done Angela. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nikki. And, and thank you everyone for, for entering. Um, and just for you non-Kiwis at the back, the tall mountain is our tallest mountain. Um, ah, Mount Cook, Araki, that's how we say it, Araki or Mount Cook, so it's thank lovely. you everyone. Yeah, lovely to meet you all, thanks for joining us. Oh, and by the way, uh, this is Eckup, this is North Leeds, that's the Washburn Valley, so that's where I'm in Yorkshire, <laughs> if you're wondering. No chocolate fish prizes, but well done for guessing. <laughs> Great, and um, yeah, just on behalf of myself, um, Javi, I'll let you have the final word, but thank you on behalf of um, Terra branch um thank you nikki and terry and jane for giving up your time for us and for everyone for joining in and, and the questions and i'm sure we could have carried on for this conversation for an hour longer so i, I suggest we could keep, keep continuing these contacting it's shown that it can be done e easily digitally um so let's keep in contact with each other um jillian will certainly be in touch with you more um and yeah let's use these formats share our information and and, and everything and, and let's continue so thank you guys thank you Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just close out. No, uh, thank you very much, uh, Nikki and Terry, um, for waking up early and uh, um, providing us with some really good engagement from uh, the New Zealand branch and our members here and non-members. Uh, it's been a really good um, two-way discussion. Lots of I've been certainly been taking lots of notes, and uh, so just. Uh, Thanks everyone else for, for joining in um, and uh, giving up sort of your late evening. Um, so, uh, Tenakoto, Tenakoto, good night, everyone. Thanks, guys. That's great. Really Thanks. enjoyed it. Thanks, everyone.